to invite you to rise as the family enters. be seated. May the grace of God eternal and the love of Christ and the presence of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Beloved friends, we gather here this day in the protective shelter of God's healing love. We gather to remember and to celebrate with thanksgiving the life of Thomas Lowell Styers. In the long process of saying goodbye to Tom, we gather to remember him, to say words of appreciation and affection, words that may have been expressed during his lifetime, but that need to be said again. Because in those words and in those memories, God gives us a glimpse of the life and the love that never die. When you entered the sanctuary, you were given a card on which you are invited to write a memory, a word of gratitude, a prayer. Tom's family will be given these cards following the service to keep. On this day, we have gathered to pool our grief, to comfort and support one another in our common loss. We have also come together to lift up our gratitude for Tom's life and for the life we were blessed to share with him. Even in the midst of sorrow, there is much to be grateful for. So while we are here together, may we also listen for God's word of hope and the promises of God that have the power to drive away despair, fill emptiness, and move us to offer God our praise. In this time of word and prayer, as love melts into memory and sadness into song, may all of us receive the consolation God intends for us. May we lean into the reassuring word that there is nothing in all creation, nothing in life or in death, that can ever separate us from the love of God. We are here on this earth for a season, but love lasts forever. And by God's grace, life is eternal too, which means that death is only a horizon, and a horizon is nothing save the limits of our own sight. Will you join me as we share these words from Ecclesiastes in our call to worship? 
For everything there is a season, matter under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to seek and a time to lose, a time to embrace, and a time to refrain from embracing. God has put a sense of past and future into our minds. God has done this so that all should stand in awe. Whatever God does endures forever. I Hello, thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Hadley, I'm the eldest grandchild of Tom. I'm gonna be reading a few poems from Charles Simic today. Um, he happens to be one of my favorite poets and actually was born in 1938, the same year that my grandfather was born and died just one day before him on January 9th. Uh, so I thought it was timely to select some of his poems. Um, they're not necessarily uh, typical memorial poems, but they, uh, the ones that I've chosen focus on ideas around eternity, religion, and some of the humor inherent in getting old. Um, so feel free to, to cry or to laugh. <laughs> so this first one is called The Something. Here come my night thoughts on crutches, returning from studying the heavens. What they thought about stayed the same, stayed immense and incomprehensible. My mother and father smile at each other knowingly above the mantle. 
The cat sleeps on. The dog growls in his sleep. Now there are only these crutches to contend with. Go ahead and laugh while I raise one with difficulty, swaying on the front porch while pointing at something in the gray distance. You see nothing, eh? Neither do I, Mr. Milkman. I better hit you once or twice over the head with this fine old prop so you don't go off muttering, I saw something. Uh, this one is called Explorers. They arrive inside the object at evening. There's no one to meet them. The lamps they carry cast their shadows back into themselves. They make notations. The sky and the earth are of the same impenetrable color. There's no wind. If there are rivers, they must be beneath the ground. There's not even dust, so we must conclude that someone passed recently with a broom. As they write, the tiny universe stitches, stitches its black thread into them. Eventually, nothing is left except a faint voice, which might belong to either, either to one of them or someone who came before. It says, I'm grateful that you've finally come. It was beginning to get lonely. I recognize you. You are all that has eluded me. And this last one uh, is short, but I wanted to include. It's titled, Left Out of the Bible. <laughs> what Adam said to Eve as they lay in the dark. Honey, what's making that dog out there bark? And uh, this is my own addendum. Uh, on the sixth day, that dog was named Trudy. <laughs> so. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, I have tissues in my pocket because I'm probably going to need them. <laughs> uh, so my poem, uh, the authorship is actually unknown, but it is attributed to David Romano. Um, oh, I'm Abby, I'm Hadley's younger sister and uh, the youngest granddaughter of Tom. Um, but this poem is titled, If Tomorrow Starts Without Me. When tomorrow starts without me, and I'm not there to see, if the sun should rise and find your eyes all filled with tears for me, I wish so much you wouldn't cry the way you did today, while thinking of the many things we didn't get to say. <sighs> I know how much you love me, as much as I love you. And each time that you think of me, I know you'll miss me too. But when tomorrow starts without me, please try to understand that an angel came and called my name and took me by the hand and said, my place was ready in heaven far above, and that I'd have to leave behind all those I dearly love. But as I turned to walk away, a tear fell from my eye, for all my life I'd always thought I didn't want to die. I had so much to live for, so much left yet to do, it seemed almost impossible that I was leaving you. I thought of all the yesterdays, the good ones and the bad. I thought of all the love we shared and all the fun we'd have. If I could relive yesterday, just even for a while, I'd say goodbye and kiss you and maybe see you smile. But then I fully realized that this could never be for emptiness and memories would take the place of me. And when I thought of worldly things I might miss tomorrow, I thought of you, and when I did, my heart was filled with sorrow. But when I walked through heaven's gate, I felt so much at home 
when God looked down and smiled at me from his great golden throne. He said, this is eternity and all I've promised you. Today, your life on earth is past, but here life starts anew. I promise no tomorrow, but today will always last. And since each day is the same way, there's no longing for the past. You have been so faithful, so trusting, and so true. There, there were times you did some things you knew you shouldn't do. But you have been forgiven. And now, at last, you're free. So won't you come and take my hand and share my life with me? So when tomorrow starts without me, don't think we're far apart. For every time you think of me, I'm right here in your heart. Thank you. My name is Tony Andres. This man, whose picture you see here, and I were classmates, oh, I better turn this mic on if I'm going to walk around this, were classmates in 1956 at DePaul. So, he's a friend. Thank you, I'll take this off. A friend. and. To me, the definition of that is something I want to share with you because it, uh, it is not a, I'm sorry. Okay. It is not a function of the mind. It is a function of the heart. Friendship begins there. And though this day was unexpected, when I received a call from Gretchen that Tom had finally transitioned into that new life, I sat and first thing I thought of was, thank you, Gretchen. Thank you, Judy. Thank you, Kathy and Brian, Savannah, John and Heather, Hadley and Abby, Pam and Chuck. Y'all did such a wonderful, wonderful time of taking care of Tom these last two months. Thank you. When I heard about his death, I, though it was, unexpected, it was expected, I took time just to sit. And I thought, I can't any longer pick up the phone and call Tom and hear Tom say, Tony. And so all I could do was sit there, and my wife, Emily, came and embraced me in the cloud of darkness dissipated, because that embrace is what this life is all about. We're here to mourn, Tom, but we're here to celebrate, and there's so much to celebrate in this man's life. You all know about his wonderful ministry, which began in the 60s, and from Corning, New York, to Milford, Connecticut, to Pasadena, Connecticut, to First Church Greenwich, 29 years and then interim at Riverside Church and Riverside and churches in Phoenix and Seattle. You know what he's accomplished, his work for the National Church, all of that, all of that. Wonderful gifts. And when I visited him, by the way, at Riverside Church, he took me around and I thought, my goodness, a church that has an elevator. Whoa, <laughs> this, is, this is different. Tom and I began back there in 19... 56. He is, I've said before at Brenda's service, the hayseed from Rushfield, Indiana's farmland. His roots grounded Chuck in that fertile soil and in a fertile faith of that Hoosier kind of faith. He and I met, I'm a kind of a reject from Youngstown, Ohio, a steel country, Rust Belt, uh, two persons coming together, so different, unbelievable. So there was a guardian angel who brought us together no doubt in my mind, for in that first year I was so lost. 
I had come, I thought I was a hot shot. First in my class of 300 in Youngstown, Ohio, and I was up against New Trier High School and Park Forest and, oh my gosh. And Tom was there for me. And when my sister died suddenly during finals of that first year, and I was lost, I came back to the PA, depressed, despairing, and the oak of his strong faith was right there, and this trembling branch could be grafted into that wonderful person, Tom Stiers. So many remembrances. Tom called me in 61 and said, come and be the best man at my wedding. What? Of all people, me? And so I came, and it was a wonderful service, and as I watched that car pull away with the tin cans in the back and all the hoorah and everything, I thought, they're on the journey, and what a journey they've had. What a journey. Gretchen, Heather, you all know what that journey was like. So many successes. There were obviously some failures. There were obviously times when they may have had disagreements, but those two were so strong. And then later, after Brenda's gone, Judy came to be with Tom, and what a blessing, what a gift. A friendship. What memories? The memory of being with Vera and Dwayne and Tom and Brenda down in Ghost Ranch in New Mexico, walking on the painted soil creeping over to see over the fence to see the wonderful ranch house of the great painter George O'Keefe. And then sitting later, a couple of days later, in the chapel of the Monastery of Christ in the Desert, where the Benedictine monks were chanting morning prayer, and just to be in the silence there, to experience those kinds of times together. And then, years later, Tom graciously accepted the call from me to come down and preside at my wedding to Emily and her parents' farm in Waynesboro, Ohio, 100 degrees out there on a farmland, a beautiful rolling farmland. And it was a great service, except that during the service, and some of you know this, Wayne, who was Emily's cousin, was to sing a song, the wedding song. But Wayne had said, because there were some children there making noise, if those children don't shut up, I'm not going to sing. And, my, and Emily's cousin happened to have a little puppy dog, a brand new dachshund, sitting in her lap, and Wayne began to sing, and the dachshund took umbrage at that and jumped off and went and grabbed his pant leg and hung on as Wayne is singing. <laughs> and Tom is standing there trying to be ministerial and then having to lose it. He just laughed, and we finally did say, I do. And the, mar <laughs> the marriage lasted all these 36 years. Images of Tom and Brenda, Emily and I, and sitting in a tent in another 105 degree heat time, Barbara near Boston, at, is a Stonewall College up there, and hearing this Vietnamese monk tell us about peace. Peace that comes not from here, but from the heart. Peace which comes from an understanding that we all are part of the light of the world, and if we let that light grow in our hearts, then indeed that's how peace comes. The other night I was lying in bed, couldn't sleep very well. I didn't realize I'm up at 5,600 feet or something like that. That's different from down being at Richmond. Uh, and I looked out, and there's this big tree with all these bulbs still glowing on it, for Christmas tree bulbs. And I thought, each one of those bulbs is a light, a glowing light light of truth and peace and hope and when you put them all together on that tree it's a community of light and Tom knew that deep in his soul he knew that that that's how you build community to bring those lights together and let them let them be a focus so what I want you to do is help me at this time we sang a song at dinner last night that Tom uh, Sir John and Heather had arranged a wonderful dinner 30 people there at the house and we sang this little, light, this little light of mine, let it shine, let it shine. So I want you to help me sing that. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine, oh Lordy. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, 
I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Tom had Jesus as his Savior. Oh, let it shine, oh Lordy. Tom had Jesus as his Savior. Oh, let it shine. Tom had Jesus as his Savior. Oh, let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. That's what Tom understood in his heart. A whole ministry of how many years? 50-some years? So the light could shine. The light could shine. What a gift to all of us. And Tom's gift to me began with his identity, his roots in that Rushfield soil, but roots in a faith that God's purpose for him and for his family to be the one who could, in his own stead, find a way to let that light shine. His identity was one that knew that what you do, is, as Thich Nhat Hanh said, is you let the peace begin in your heart because then it flows out as a servanthood to others and then it begins to glow and it glows his identity I don't know how it came into me but I think he somehow gave that to me I never intended to end up in seminary me in Youngstown Ohio but I did and a lot of that is due to Tom Stiers much of it through Tom Stiers. So his identity was servant, but his identity was also as a theologian. Tom read far more books than I ever read uh, in theology, Tillich, and of course, St. Augustine, all the church fathers, all of that. But theology for Tom was theos logos, which is not an understanding of the disparate notions of the identity of Christ, homoousion or homoousioi. It was an understanding that the knowledge of God is a knowledge of people and how Christ lives in us. That's the knowledge of God. And Tom intuitively knew that. Intuitively knew that. His theology was a theology of love and sharing and caring. Identity, understanding how you understand God. And finally, he was so beloved by his community of believers and his friends all over. That came to me so wonderfully when I attended his retirement from First Church Greenwich. Wonderful. They had a wonderful banquet, all the kudos that honors people could say, and then they presented him with a scholarship fund at, I think, Union Seminary in his name. But that was the frosting on the cake. The real gifts was that incredible love which they showed to him in thankfulness for his ministry. For Tom was a pastor in the real sense of the word, a shepherd of the flock, a real pastor in that sense. Identity, servanthood, understanding God, a shepherd. Finally, a friend, a friend. You know, if you read John's Gospel, you find that at the Last Supper in John's Gospel, Jesus has this wonderful prayer, and he looks finally at Peter and the others, and he says, you know what? I once called you servants. Now I call you a friend. Remarkable. Remarkable. And this man, Tom Stiers, a servant, and called by his Lord, friend. And when he entered those pearly gates and St. Peter looked at him, and I'm sure St. Peter said to Tom, come on in, friend. This is the wonderful reward for all those years. Miss him, yes. Celebrate his life, yes. Amen, amen. And my definition of friendship, it always will be, is a name, Tom Stiers. Thanks be to God. Amen. Well, for Vera and I also, 
It all began in Greencastle, Indiana. Brenda and Vera first met as student staff on the dorm staff at DePaul University. Tom and I connected waiting tables at the Alpha Chi sorority. All four of us were active in the Methodist student movement when, back when we were active Methodists. Vera and I married first in 1960. Brenda and Tom joined forces in 1961. After some postgraduate years, we all ended up on the East Coast with young children. And because our families and roots remained in the Midwest, we became an extended family for each other. Memorable Thanksgivings in Cape Cod and New York, and other casual weekend visits on weekends with Gretchen and Heather, Scott and Kevin, making mischief as growing children. Have you ever known a minister that prepared his sermon on Tuesday? <laughs> that discipline in Tom's character was why we could have social gatherings with Tom and Brenda on Friday or Saturday. And we did travel part of the world together. Wonderful trip to the British Midlands. A delightful cruise around the Iberian Peninsula ending in Barcelona and a magical night in Morocco, but that's another story. And then with Tom and Judy, a fascinating trip to Cuba. <clears throat> One other jewel in Tom's character was his uncanny ability to connect with people. Didn't matter whether it was the CEO of IBM or the manager at the feed store in Rushville. If you sat down with Tom in a one-on-one -on -one conversation, you came away having revealed your values, interests, loves, the important things in your life. The approach was pastoral, not paternal, and the interest was genuine. Vera and I are so grateful to, been a, to have been a part of the Steyer's circle of friends. And we are deeply grateful that Judy has been his partner in this final journey. I count Tom as among my closest of friends over many years. And I will miss him dearly.
Tom would have been so happy to see you all turn out. He's here with us. He is. What a crowd. Thank you. As farm boys, we learned how to work together, to cooperate, having God in our lives, and how to love. Together, we dug ditches, milked cows, hauled manure, baled hay, went to church every Sunday, didn't miss. Then in our adult years, we struggled with the ditches of life. We milked the system for our <clears throat> advancing ourselves. We had a lot of manure and crap in our lives. <laughs> church and God were a part of our lives daily. We shared immensely. We kept the family love going. Tom, the shock of the inevitable, hospice care, overwhelmed me. I was comfortable with the sharing and the many weeks of transfusion and treatments. You battled through Thanksgiving, you battled through Christmas, you battled through New Year's. And I look forward to sharing more in our life together. But then you made your passage, your passage to a great new adventure in life. You told me how you envisioned arriving at the pearly gates. There'd be a long bridge, shining lights. Brenda would be coming across that bridge first, then Mom and Dad and Jim. Tom Duggins, Doug Bear, many others, Winnie and Harlan, many dear friends would be coming across that bridge to meet him from there. But of course, we had this Aunt Frances. She was always telling us what to do. She'll be there telling Tom how to greet God and Jesus. She wants him to do it right. <laughs> Tom, it's an honor to share your life with your fan club here today. On one recent visit, I asked Tom about the most exciting things in his life. And guess what the first one was? Brenda saying yes to the proposal of his, his proposal of marriage. We're glad she did. We're glad she did. Gretchen and Heather's birth and continuing sharing life with them. Second. Thirdly, two wonderful grandchildren, Hadley and Abby. He enjoyed it. One time he said, you know, those teenage girls, they don't talk much, but if I take them someplace with friends in the back seat, I learn all kinds of things about them. <laughs> yeah. And as Tony mentioned, uh, his various ministries in Milford, North Haven, Greenwich, as an assistant, and then was called to be the senior minister there. Fifth, his intern church ministries at Riverside in New York, then in Phoenix at the UCC Church, and then at Plymouth Church in Seattle. Sixth, he said, in his loneliness as a widow, widower, he called me and said, I'm so lonely, what do I do? And I was so glad of that day when he called and said, I've met you. And we're glad he did. It abolished that feeling of loneliness. What precious memories we shared. Tom was my brother. You know, we were, didn't have a lot of money. We were buying a farm and the like, and Tom and I slept in a double-sized bed together, you know. It was sure nice on those cold nights. We <laughs> Back to back, we snuggled together to keep warm. <laughs> Tom was a pillar of support in my life, always there for me. He was my informant. He was a news junkie who loved reading the paper daily, sports, comics, facts. He was a trivia king. He would read anything. <laughs> he just would. He was my protector when I was little. 
I grew up just right after World War II, and I'd hear strange noises, and I would think the war was coming to our town, and he would assure me that it wasn't. Tom was a father to me. Our dad worked in uh, Indianapolis at Allison's. He was an airplane mechanic for the test pilots at the airport. Tom helped me in many things, like a father. He was a mentor. He guided me in my life decisions and my education, where I should be educated. He and Brenda guided me to the University of California, where I got my degree and my master's. He helped me to see the light of God and Jesus. He showed me the way. Now, he wasn't perfect. He was a tormentor, too. I was a target of his BB gun a few times. <laughs> he loved to play bis- baseball, so practicing baseball, he'd pick up a rock and throw it. And I was a target of that, and I got a couple of scars to show that. <laughs> he listened to me as I struggled to find the real truth in life, to find the way. He was my political advisor. If I didn't understand something's going on in Washington or country, I'd call Tom. He'd read enough, the New York Times and the like, he knew about it. He was a true friend, as Tony said, throughout my life. He was a great uncle to my kids and grandkids. When Carrie was 12, he bought her the Nelson Mandela book to read, and she read it. (laughs) She did. He shared sports with Tanya. Shared sports. They love sharing sports. Tom knew all the facts and figures. No one could outdo him. (laughs) All of you knew who knew him well, knew what an incredible mind he had and what a great intellect he had. I always admire that. I'd say, I'd I'd tell him, I'd compliment him on that. He says, well, you're the doer. You do all the things. I'm, I'm, I'm the book reader. His first job was as a peddler to make his first dollar in his life. Mom book, we lived in town in, in the beginning of our life. She would bake cookies and he'd get on his bike and pedal them around the neighborhood and sell them to the ladies. Later he did greeting cards that mom ordered and he sold. So he became a peddler, a salesman. It was not easy to follow in his footsteps in many ways. One memory I have is on January 5th of this year, Tom called with a report. Doctor says the treatments and blood transfusions are no more effective. The doctors have stopped them. I will be going on hospice. What a shock. That night I had a dream. Tom visited me in my home in Florida. We still have the child rocking chair that we sat in when we were kids. And with his frail body, he sat in that rocking chair. And we shared life. We shared life. And then I had this vision of him in heaven, sitting in the rocker beside the heavenly throne with family and friends around him. To get us going, to know the Bible, Mom had gone to a Salvation Army used store and bought this huge Bible of stories. Every Sunday night, Tom and I had to sit there and struggle through all those hard names and places to pronounce, but we, we learned the Bible stories. We learned the Bible stories. Of course, we had no cell phones growing up. That was, you know, back in the ancient ages. Tom loved the radio. His two favorite shows were Captain Midnight and Lowell Thomas News. Lowell Thomas News on the radio. (laughs) Finally, when we got a TV on the farm, we were not allowed to watch it during the week. It was school, did our chores on the farm, and studying. No TV during the week. Tommy always had something to read, you know. If, If I couldn't find him on the farm when we were working on the job, he was in his two favorite reading places. He had a room, he'd taken a little room in the barn and made that his library. And he had all kinds of sporting news there, 
Billy Graham pamphlets. You know, he was a Billy Graham fan then uh, and had all kinds of books to read. But the other place was we uh, had an outhouse, so when we had our dirty boots on, we didn't go in the house. He was there reading in the outhouse. <laughs> And as Tony, as uh, Dwayne mentioned, we had Thanksgiving with them 17 years in a row in Cape Cod, Walden Three. We loved that. We loved that. We were inland in Rushville, Indiana. We didn't see the ocean, but once a year we got to see the ocean and the beautiful beaches and have family time. Upon graduation from high school, Tom, we still paying for the farm, and Tom didn't have much money, the family didn't have much money for him to go to college, and he was offered a scholarship at Franklin College, which is a little conservative. Our Methodist minister, Dr. Talbert at the time, heard he was going to Franklin, and he came in, he called Tom, and he says, you're not going to Franklin, you're going to DePaul. And Tom says, I don't have the money. I'll get you a scholarship, you gotta go there. So he got a scholarship, and what a change that was for his life. He met these wonderful people, Tony and, and Dwayne and Vera and Brenda. When he went to college at DePaul in the summertime, he came back to the farm to live, and we farmed together because my dad worked in Indianapolis. But the district, Methodist district superintendent gave him little churches. And so each summer, he had a church that he went to. And as someone younger than he, and I love food, I love going to all those church dinners and the like. Those country ladies were great cooks. <laughs> but when Tom was ready out at seminary and the like, he came back to District Superintendent Tyler. He says, I, I want to preach. And, uh, well, I got, some ur I got some rural churches and the like. Tom says, no, I want an urban church. The district superintendent says, well, all the ministers start out in a real church, and then they graduate up to them. Tom said, goodbye, I'm leaving the Methodist church, and he went to the UCC church. I went to the East Coast, and what a, what a history he had there. A few more insights of our family and Tom. Mom would never spank us, but I can still see her running around with her hairbrush threatening Tom when he did something bad. <laughs> One of Tom's terrible ministry was when I was in the first grade, our grandmother's father died, our grandfather, Molson. And it was tradition then that we kids, that the kids should kiss the corpse. Oh, Tom hated that. <laughs> he, did, he, he did not like that. Recently, uh, when we were visiting Tom, TJ, my son, and I were there. And TJ has transitioned and looking for a new name. And she surprised Tom and I both. She says, Tom, I want my new name to be Thomas. And Tom was shocked and just elated also that TJ would accept his name. So his name continues on. For years, Tom loved peanut butter, loved peanut butter. But I hear in the last few years, he'd, he'd have it every morning to get an English muffin and break it on there and the like, and I uh, always enjoyed it when I visited him. But someone said recently he went to cream cheese. He blew my mind, so. <laughs> I asked Tom what he would miss most when he retired, you know, and I would think, you know, preaching to all these people and everything, and he says, you know what I miss most? My secretary, she kept me organized. <laughs> we shared many a baseball game together. We played basketball and baseball in the farm, barnyard. Many times when knocked out a window, our dad never complained. He liked it that we were playing in our off time. But Tom scared me with his fastball. I always thought he would nail me with that, but he never did. Bless his heart. <laughs> I knew he loved me. Especially when he invited me to go on the honeymoon with Judy and him. I couldn't believe someone would invite someone else to go on the honeymoon with him. 
Oh, what a best friend, and what a great find we have in Judy. So, love you. We uh, did the Rhine River cruise in Amsterdam, then later we did Alaska, or I think we did Alaska first. <laughs> Finally, winding down here, Thomas is now healed. He is well. He's well on his way to a great new adventure. Tom, you have left us many memories and lots of wisdom. You have been my friend throughout my life. Farewell, au revoir, dearest brother, to our earthly time together. I look forward to sharing more, and when I, too, arrive on the other side sharing with you. We release you, the Reverend Thomas Lowell Styers, to the heavens. As his ashes go back into the world, his lovely soul goes to heaven and he will be with God's tribe. Farewell, dear brother. Thank you for your earthly time together. Job well done. We celebrate the gift of your life with us. I love you, brother. You're precious to me. The things you learn at events like this. Who knew my uncle had a brushback pitch? <laughs> Good morning. I'm uh, Sarah Bunting, Tom's niece. Um, I'm a writer, and uh, when you're a writer, times like this really wish, uh, make you wish you were a plumber instead. <laughs> um, you want to come through with just the right phrasing, but uh, the fact is, ain't none. Still, I was honored to be asked to say a few words at this bittersweet gathering to celebrate Tom. I was also well aware that what I am usually really being asked for in these situations is jokes. <laughs> Funny anecdotes, give everyone a little break, take a breath, like Truvy says in Steel Magnolias, laughter through tears is my favorite emotion. I'm never trying to argue with Dolly Parton. So sure, that's the plan. Tell a funny story about Tom, but uh, the funniest story I have about Tom involves a pitch dark, arctic cold walk to Nauset Light Beach after Thanksgiving dinner. I think uh, several of the attendees may remember this one. Um, Tom and I literally fell into a ditch <laughs> together, but there's just not that much more to the story, honestly. <laughs> was darker than the inside of a dog, as he would have said. We fell off the road and into some leaves. Someone heard us laughing like lunatics and came back to help us up. The end. Um, <laughs> you probably had to be there, and I'm glad I was there. Uh, no one was harmed, and I do think of that tumble every single time I pass that little spot on Cable Road in East Ham. Don't get me wrong. But it doesn't get at the qualities in Tom that I especially treasured. This is the most curious and companionable soul I ever knew, who could tolerate a high level of this will make a good story someday foolishness. So obviously, if you were fixing to blunder into the underbrush in the middle of the night, that's your guy. But the story on my mind is from about a dozen years ago when I was passing through Boulder on another even more deranged big country little car mission than the one I'm on right now. And Tom offered to take me around to see a few sights. I'd arrived later in the day than I'd planned because I'd managed to get lost several times, not in any ditches, but not for lack of trying. So everything that Tom had meant to show me was closed. So we just drove around and we listened to the radio, and we talked about the things we heard on it. Not much of that story either, I guess. He was interested in the world, always ready to know something or someone new, to hear a good story or to be in one. Sometimes the ones, the stories that there aren't much to, are the best ones, because they're small and you can keep them close. We drove around in a summer afternoon and we recommended books to each other. That's not everyone's heaven, but it's where you'll find me if I get to go. Tom's in a good story now for sure. I wish we could hear all about it. Failing that, let's all of us keep hearing each other's good stories and be in them. Tom, I love you the most, and only for you will I say this. Go Rockies.
You know what this cost me? <laughs> the rest of you, look out for ditches. <laughs> Love you the most. Thank you for being here. beautiful souls and hello to Uncle Tom wherever you may be. Today I'm reading Psalm 121, 121. I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord which made heaven and earth. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He that keepeth thee will not slumber. Behold he that is keep that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is thy keeper. The Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand. The sun shall not smite thee by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. He shall preserve thy soul. The Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. As my dad said, my name is Thomas Joyce Dyers, and I've had the great, great honor and privilege of being both his niece and his nephew and having my uncle love me and accept me for all the ways that I show up in the world. It's just the greatest gift someone could ever give. I'm reading Psalm 100. An exhortation to thanksgiving. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates. With thanksgiving, and into his courts 
with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. Praise be to God. Hear these words now from Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in bright paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk, Through the darkest valley, the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. Thanks be to God. One of the privileges and gifts that comes with being a pastor is that we are granted access to be with people at some of the most tender and vulnerable moments of their lives including those times when they are standing on the threshold between life and death. In those remarkable moments, it's as if a doorway suddenly opens and we all find ourselves staring into the face of mystery. Even when it's clear that death is on its way, there is nothing that can fully prepare anyone for the fullness of that experience. At such times, I am aware that when I enter a room, a living room or a hospital room, I am bringing much more than myself through the door. I'm not sure I've ever had a clearer and more powerful sense of that truth than when Linda Kowatch and I visited Tom and Judy on Friday a week and a half ago in their home at Fraser Meadows. The day before that visit, they had found out that the blood transfusions keeping Tom alive and renewing his energy week by week had stopped working. For months, we had known that this day would arrive. Now it was here. Hospice would be coming the next day to arrange Tom's final days and hours. Linda and I knew that this was quite possibly, quite probably, the last time we would be able to speak with Tom. So when we entered the room that day, God's presence was palpable, and we brought all of you with us, the whole congregation, the whole church, We brought with us your care, your blessing, and your great love. That tender visit gave us a moment to thank Tom on behalf of all of us for his service to this church, for bringing his many years of experience and wisdom to our endowment and stewardship efforts, for his role in birthing our ministry of last things, for his unfailing support and encouragement for Linda's and Pedro's and my ministries, for his guiding candidates through the ordination process as a member of the Metropolitan Denver Association's Committee on Ministry. Linda spoke with Tom on behalf of Men's Breakfast. 
the 20 or more men who gather early every Friday to share joys and concerns and discuss important questions of faith and life. When she told Tom how the group had gathered that very morning to speak about how much they love him and will miss him, Tom broke into tears. I will too, he said. So much love. We remembered Brenda's death. We rejoiced in Tom and Judy's courtship and their wedding in this sanctuary. The changes and passages, the sorrows and joys shared in the midst of church life. I was also so glad to have this chance to thank Tom for his many, many years of ministry. For 50 years, Tom served as a pastor in the United Church of Christ. Most of that time at churches in Connecticut, including 29 years at First Congregational Church in Greenwich from 1974 until 2003. The new ministries formed at First Church during Tom's tenure are too many to name, but included in that inspiring list are international partnerships and projects in Togo, Honduras, Turkey, Zimbabwe, and Hungary. Tom also served for several years on the executive committee of the national setting of the United Church of Christ, and he was the chair of the board of directors of the Connecticut Conference during a significant turning point in its life. After his retirement from First Church, as you've already heard, Tom began a series of interim ministries with other flagship congregations in the UCC. Riverside Church in New York City, Church of the Beatitudes in Phoenix, Arizona, and Plymouth UCC in Seattle, Washington. For a person so accomplished, Tom was remarkably humble. Recently, I happened to find out that the first sermon Tom preached to First Church Greenwich in 1974 was on the subject of hospitality. His inspiration was the work of spiritual writer Henry Nowen. When Judy asked if we could find something from Nowen to add to the memorial service, the church staff went looking through his essays on hospitality. Our favorite quotes are on the back of your bulletin. When we read those two short pieces, along with the quote from Union Seminary's theologian Reinhold Niebuhr, it dawned on us how much they speak of the essence of Tom's spirit, his generosity and gentleness, his ability to be fully present with each person, to listen with great attention and care, to turn strangers into friends, to receive others with a curious mind and an open heart, to engage the gifts of the community, and above all else, to place his hope and his trust in God's goodness and love. It's in that same trust, that same love, that we now gently place Tom in the care of the one who watches over our going out and our coming in, whose steadfast love endures and whose faithfulness is for all generations. The Good Shepherd, who gently leads us to green fields, beside still waters, who anoints our heads with healing oil and restores our souls, who sets a table before us to feed us, fills our cup to overflowing, follows us with goodness and with mercy all the days of our lives, and then brings us to dwell in a house, God's home forever. Our prayer of thanksgiving will be offered 
by a longtime friend of the Steyer's family, who also happens to be my seminary classmate, Barbara Livingston. It is my absolute honor to be here with you this morning as we honor the life of such an amazing person in the lives of all of us. All of us here, all of us on the live stream listening in who could not be here. I'm here because I'm one life of the many touched by the life and ministry of Tom Stiers. My brief story is that I was there at that sermon in 1974. <laughs> I was 14. My family attended the First Congregational Church of Greenwich, and I loved that church. Tom was the one who confirmed me to my faith. He blithely said in one of our confirmation classes, he said to us that if anybody ever was interested in going to work on a farm and to find out what that would be like, that we should come talk to him. Because he had family who had a farm in the Midwest and that he would set it up for us. I don't think Tom ever thought that anybody would actually take him up on that offer. We were a bunch of kids from a very well-to-do suburb in Connecticut. It was unlikely that people had a hankering to go work on a farm. But as it happens, one summer, my senior year of high school, my job fell through at the very last minute. And the words of Tom Stiers came into my mind, and I said, I think I'm going to go talk to Tom and take him up on that offer. <laughs> and that is the beginning of an, a whole other hilarious and very deeply meaningful chapter in my life. So it is with that and with Tom being the one that when I felt called to ministry, he was one of the first people that I told, and he unfailingly supported me through that whole process. So please let us pray the prayer of thanksgiving. Gracious and loving God, we come to you this morning to give thanks for the life of your beloved son, Thomas Lowell Stiers deeply loved son, brother, husband, and father, minister, friend, mentor, and colleague, called by you to minister to people from all walks of life. He answered your call and was a faithful servant. He was deeply committed to living out your great commandment to love you, others, and self. Thank you for giving him the many great strengths found in his deep caring, his kindness, and his compassion, his abiding curiosity, insight, determination, his ability to build relationship and call forth the best in those around him not perfectly, but with grace and with humility. Thank you for his sense of fun, his great passion for the Mets, his humor, wry smile and wit, his great laugh. We give you thanks for his devotion to his family and dear friends, which was truly unparalleled. His light and his love for you, God. It lit a path. It lit a path so others could find you in all these things which made him one of your wonderful creations. We celebrate and give thanks for the life he lived. For it touched, graced, 
and brought joy to the lives of so, so many people, particularly those gathered in this place and those joining us online, and I know there are many. He graced us in ways we will always be grateful for, hold dear and carry forward doing as he would, give to others in ways to build up and bring forth one's best and most authentic self. Be with us now as we give thanks for and celebrate the life of your son, Tom, who loved you and honored you his whole life so that we too might know faith, hope, and love. Be with us in our grief and loss, and help us find our way forward in a world where he now resides in our hearts. Guide him safely home to you, where he is surely reunited with those who have gone before him. With thanks and deep gratitude for a life well lived, we honor and cherish the memory of the man we all knew as Tom, or as brother, or as dad, who was there for all as best he could be, and shone a light on the path toward knowing with deep assurance that God's love is abundant and unconditional. Thank you for gracing the earth with the gift of Tom Styers. Well done, good and faithful servant. In all this we pray. Amen.
benediction, you are invited to a reception downstairs in our Plymouth Hall. To get there, if you exit the, the sanctuary to the right, you'll find a set of stairs. If you go to the left and go down the hallway, you will find an elevator that will take you to the lower level. Turn left when you exit the elevator and keep following the hallway. You'll find your place there. You will also find downstairs name tags for you to wear as you greet the family, so please be sure to fill one out. As we go from this place, may God be above you to protect you, beside you to befriend you, behind you to support you, and before you to lead the way. May God bless you and keep you. May God's love surround you on every side to sustain you this day and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>